what what could it possibly be like to actually have people whispering did he murder his wife there were literally falsehoods invented you know that she had gone in a car to meet ahmed patel mm. uh, that there were two hitmen from du- dubai who had checked into the same hotel i mean there were incredible lies being made up uh, one politician even claimed oh he poured russian poison into her mouth as if he had been sitting there and witnessing at the last moments this kind of nonsense mm. but Evidence living through that time it. your your elderly mother was accosted by a neighbor yeah with questions about what had happened and what was your role in it Oh it was worse I mean it was it was you know she she was people spoke to her in the elevator of her building in Kochi almost as if you know she was the mother of a murderer kind of thing mm. born in britain but when i look at myself in the mirror i see an indian i don't know how many people widely know shashi tharoor that you were born in england and we'll get to that part of your life story in a moment from now <laughs> that's where it began <laughs> but i'm intrigued as to what it means to look at yourself in the mirror and see an indian what do indians look like in the mirror well they look more like us than they do like brits it's as simple as that i mean the thing is that Look, uh, I I've actually asked myself what I meant by this. I've been saying it since I was yeah. a kid. Uh when people, you know, when there was a time when people say, "My gosh, you can actually take a British passport and you haven't. What's the matter? Why don't you?" And this used to be my answer. But it's also quite simply that, you know, we all have a sense of who we are. Hmm. What constitutes that? I think will vary according to time and circumstance and I fully appreciate the fact that Rishi Sunak looks in the mirror and sees somebody who's more like me and you than like uh, like you know Duncan Cameron but who nonetheless But in the age been, of hybrid identities you didn't feel British in you you said Indian yeah and my my parents see my father went to England as a student stayed on to work came back to India to marry uh, brought his wife to England I was born but he never saw himself as a permanent migrant he was looking for opportunities to come back to india and his last job in england was heading the london office of the statesman at a time when all the statesman's managers in india were englishmen so he had to wait for an englishman to retire before he could have a vacancy he could apply for mm. and that's what happened when i was a couple of years old he got a chance to come and be the bombay manager and so he happily applied got it popped on a ship and came back to um, to india so for him that was the natural thing to do because he he had gone off to england it was just after independence i must have bit in 48 but nonetheless he'd gone off to england much the same spirit that malayalis all the time are pushing off to bombay or delhi or calcutta yeah. in the hope of bettering their prospects and it was that that was the spirit in which a lot of uh, a lot of keralites left kerala to look for better opportunities uh, but they never really saw themselves as abandoning the homeland mm. and so i guess i just was born into that kind of mentality People might think that the clipped uh, British accent is therefore uh, an accident of birth, a consequence of being Not born in all. London. How much do you speak at two, two and a half? No, I picked up my English in India. Really, I mean, I think uh, uh, when I was a kid, I would say things like, "I want to go to mummy," or words to that effect, in in a more British accent than I do now. But this is the English, frankly, we were taught. I went to Campion School, Bombay, where our teachers. all spoke like this and i went to st stephen's college where a lot of my seniors spoke like actually i, I had, went to college and i don't speak like you well you went after my time my vintage was what rajiv mehrotra salman khurshid uh, babu basu I and mean, people have all spoke like this so it's not as if uh, it's not as if i was uh, akbar zahir i remember used to be one of our amateur actors he sub- subsequently left uh, but the point is that uh, there was a large large eclectic selection of voices at mm. st stephen's but this was if you like the typical quote and quote i mean across accent. the ideological trenches swapan das gupta who went to st stephens also speaks like you there you are and in the uh, accent at least but chandan mitra who was a classmate of both of us doesn't sound like us so true. it varies and there always were exceptions but this was the sort of the, the classic stephenian thing and frankly many many of us spoke like this so i i wouldn't at all claim any distinctiveness except that for some reason the way i speak has become an issue in indian uh, public no, life and i'm just... happy to wear it on my on my sleeve as it were as well as on my tongue but you play to the gallery also right i was you know when i was researching for this conversation and the attempt of uh, our podcast inside out is is to see if we can get to know people inside out and not ask them the usual questions that we ask them in the daily grind of journalism 
And the intriguing thing is that while doing the Google search on, you know, finding interesting things about you, I find a Quora question. And the question says, why does Shashi Tharoor use big words? And there's no actual intelligent, explicable answer to this. So why do you? Because I'm not sure I actually do. Look, I, this whole thing started, as you remember, when I lost my cool with uh, a certain unnamed, unpleasant uh, television anchor and accused him of a farrago of distortions, misrepresentations. He who shall and not outright be named. Lies, exactly. Yes. And out, outright lies um, by a showman masquerading as a journalist. Two words to that effect. The Farago is apparently what triggered it up because suddenly in an hour's time, there was a bewildered tweet from the Oxford English Dictionary asking why suddenly, for no particular reason that they could understand, a million Indians were searching for the meaning of the word Farago. And they said never in the history of the Oxford English Dictionary had more than six or seven people looked up this word. So they wanted to know why. And that's how this whole saga started. I, I remember for whatever reason, this is a word, by the way, that I had used frequently in debates since in Stevens College. It wasn't exactly an unknown word, hmm. but clearly it had fallen out of common use. Because the next thing I knew was that this particular um, this particular word had 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 captured various people's imagination. There was a whole bunch of accounts being opened by people calling themselves so and so Farago and so on, and uh, Officer Farago and varying variations on those themes. I was being dubbed Mr. Farago by others. And suddenly this became something to do with my choice of vocabulary, whereas I always prided, my, prided myself on being a communicator. Mm -hmm. And if you want to communicate, you speak language that people can understand, otherwise you don't get your message across. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought, well, like, what do I do? I may as well you know, uh, turn this to my advantage. If this is the image I'm going to be given, uh, I'll try and make something positive mm -hmm. out of it. So I remember not too long after we had a particular episode when a certain chief minister who had run for elections as an ally of ours turned tail or switched sides and hopped over to the dark side, as mm -hmm. it were, in his state. So I just tweeted another large word. Uh, I wrote a word of the day, snollygoster, first used 1848, definition, shrewd, unprincipled politician, latest use in India today. I didn't mention his name. I didn't mention his state. I didn't mention the circumstances, but everyone knew what I was talking about. I've been very amused since to see the word actually popping up in other people's political articles about, about India. So it, it sort of found its place. Mm. And then, of course, the, the, crown, the crowning moment came when my publishers, uh, as I was about to release my book, The Paradoxical Prime Minister, asked me to tweet about its availability. And I mm. thought, you know, just one more tweet about a book coming out when every author is publicizing their book is not going to make much of an impact. So why don't I play along with the same mm. old big, big word thing? And I tweeted... Uh, uh, you know, this book, The Paradoxical Prime Minister, is more than just a 400-page exercise in floxinos in nihilipilification. But I did... As how do you I even say... How can you pronounce that word? <laughs> well, how many times did you have to try before you could say it? <laughs> no, you didn't really learn this in St. Stephen's College. I did learn it in St. Stephen's Liar. College. I swear. <laughs> See, you folks are seriously underestimating... Um, all of us, because, because there was no television. There was one Doordarshan channel, that was it, other yeah. than a Kisan channel. Yeah. There was absolutely was no other distraction, no mobile phones, no computers, no internet, no Nintendo. What do you do? You read or you write or you do both. And so essentially, uh, my sort of quote-unquote extensive vocabulary comes from indiscriminate reading. Mm -hmm. And we all came I, mean, I had plenty of people at college who would, uh, who would you know, exchange banter along these lines. And floxinosi and nihilipilification must have come to me from some senior. And it means what? It means the act of estimating something or someone as worthless. So I'm here saying, look, the book isn't just saying that the prime minister is worthless. I've actually got some serious analysis and readable stuff in it. Do read the book. Hmm. Um, and sure enough, the use of that word generated a huge amount of flurry of interest. And suddenly this tweet about a book got far more attention than any book announcement would otherwise have got. So it became a bit of a joke against myself that I was able to twist to a, um, a certain purpose. But honestly, whenever I go to audiences of schools or colleges, particularly schools, and people say, oh, please teach us one new word today. I say, the only word you really need to know is my favorite word. They're all looking with. I say, read. Because <laughs> that's the one word you yeah. need. You read 
and you will acquire all the vocabulary. Well, well, uh, well since I believe you're uh, exploring millennial and Gen Z lingo, we're in the age of TLDR, too long didn't read. Uh, so it's really tough to get people to, uh, to, to actually read, but point taken. Let's talk a little bit about your parents. You've written quite movingly about them in, in, in one of your books. And you've spoken about how you, you, you adored your father. And I think separately you've spoken about how Maybe you were a tad unfair to your mother, who you thought is the sort of, you know, the harridan, I think, is the word you used. But later in life, you're walking with your father, I think, in Mumbai on Marine Drive. And, you, you know, he's quite upset about the fact that when you were small, he believed, as perhaps all parents of his generation did in corporal punishment, and that you got smacked a fair bit as a child. Oh, like, a lot. Yeah. What did you usually get smacked for? Almost anything. Like? Any of dropped or spilled something, whack. I didn't do something that went told to promptly, whack. You know, and only your father, and, and only your father whacked something. you. Only my father. And yet, your mother is the one you call the Harrison, and the father is the one you adore. It's interesting because obviously these feelings evolve. I'm mm. sure you asked me at different ages. I would of have course, had different feelings. Of I, um, you know, uh, I, I the things I adore about my father were his extraordinary capacity for love, which uh, mm. you don't associate typically with men, but he had an incredibly loving heart. Uh, and I know I got an enormous, enormous uh, uh, sign of it pretty much mm. every day of my life with him. Second was his extraordinarily broad-minded approach uh, to parenting, considering he's also a parent is giving you wax, mm. um, is that, for example, when it came to crucial choices, um, he allowed me to follow my instincts. There were a lot of things that he directed me to. I mean, I, I was a bit of an introverted kid and he was the opposite. He was mm. a deeply extrovert man. But he insisted that to get on in life, I just needed to get away from this kid in the corner reading books all the time. I mean, you mean, you mean as a child, you were not this gregarious person? No, in front on the of contrary, I, I would have this terrible habit of sitting in a corner curled up with a book at any time. Uh, I, was, I was always a, a reader. But that, uh, my father sort of, for example, forced me into public speaking, elocution contests, speech contests, and debates at a very early yeah. age. In fact, so young that I was so young that he used to write my speeches for me initially. And I would mug them up and debate. But eventually, you know, just getting used to standing in front of an audience and commanding an audience, uh, you learn to do things for yourself. Um, when Pearl Padamsi, the wonderful uh, character actress, when she started theater classes, at my school in Bombay, after mm. after school mm. hours, mm. I was the first kid enrolled there because my dad said, this will do you a lot of good. And indeed, I found a talent for acting, which I didn't know I had. And I ended up winning the Best Actor Award in and school And later, there's this, there's this classic picture of you from St. Stephen's College with Mira Nair, then in Miranda, <laughs> doing what play together? Anthony and Cleopatra. She still calls me my Anthony, which I, <laughs> I know she does with a great, uh, you know, tongue in cheek. But anyway, um, the, the one kissing scene we had, she apparently consumed vast quantities of onions beforehand, so I wouldn't get too close. <laughs> Mind you, she was a fresher poor thing and I was, you know, uh, a dreaded senior. So there was yeah. already all these gaps between us. So anyway, um, when I when I look back on all of that, for example, in the class, you know, I was I just had a talent for taking exams. I kept... Uh, I kept doing ridiculously well when it came to tests. So I got admitted to the third grade in a boarding school. The one time I was sent off to boarding school when I was five and a half. So I was celebrating my sixth birthday when the kids around me were turning eight. Hmm. So that didn't do me much good. I was already an asthmatic kid and yeah. psychologically, emotionally, I just wasn't ready for this. And yeah. I had terrible asthma, I spent much of my year in the infirmary. So despite being sick a lot of the time, I still managed to ace the exams, but I was sent home by the school and said, this kid is too young for boarding school. Mm -hmm. So when I went and took the entrance examinations of the fourth grade, I again aced them. But the teacher said, there's no way we're going to put a six-year-old in the fourth grade. He'll just have to do third grade again. So I, 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 had, to, I had to do that and I ended up... Uh, so you're one of those genius types. The other kids must have hated you. Yeah, but... <laughs> Did they hate you? Did the other kids hate you? Yeah, no, I mean, you I, know how I, at that age... <laughs> You you no, like you really oddly, feel irritated by the topper. I suppose, but oddly enough, I had a lot of friends both in Bombay and, and Calcutta. So I'm not sure that that they hated me. And oddly enough, my my, my Bombay classmates, uh, I'm still in touch with on a WhatsApp group. I mean, it's quite amazing. All these 50 years after I left the school. But coming back to the story, so at class nine we had to stream. So end of class eight, 
And I opted for humanities. Mm. And my teachers and principal were quite upset. And they summoned my parents to the school and said, this kid's our best science student. Mm. Why does he want to take humanities? And my father, being a good middle class you know, Kerala professional, wants me to be a son, wants his son to be a, a doctor or an engineer. So he said, what are you doing? Why, why don't you want to do this? And I said, I don't like the subject. He said, but you come first in it. Yeah. And the teachers say, you're their best science yeah. student. I said, Dad, I don't like the subject. I just happen to be good at taking exams. I said, you know, I'll write the exam, but the next day I'll forget everything I've learned just for the purpose of the exam. Whereas you ask me anything on history or literature, and I'll tell you things beyond what we were required to study for the exam, because I really mm. am interested in the subject. And he was good enough to say, all right, in that case, take what you want. And once again, at the end, when I, I managed to get the highest marks in India, the ISC examinations, so I was all set to do what I you know, wanted to do and do mm. a BA degree. Again, the choice came. He said, for God's sake, do economics. You can go get an MBA afterwards, make a lot of money. What are you going to do otherwise? He said, I said, I want to do history. And again, he was broad-minded enough to let me follow my... And then when I finished from college, I topped Delhi University. He said, at least take the entrance exams to the IIMs. We had two in those days. And you got in? I got in first in one and second in the other. I am Ahmedabad and, and I Calcutta. Calcutta. Yes. And then uh, I, I had parallelly applied to studies in, in things that I was interested in at American universities and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy offered me a full scholarship to study international affairs. And so I said, I'd like to go there and do that. And, he said, and you know, he was seeing this dream of his son being at least, you know, some, you know, fat cat executive in the Hindustanized multinational disappear before his eyes. But he again supported me in that. So would he, would I, I would he, would he have that. been horrified that you're a, that you're a politician? Actually, oddly enough, maybe not, because, you know, he, he, in many ways, I think, was prevented by the realities of having to earn a living mm. from, from following his own instincts. He might have made a very good politician himself. First of all, he was a people person in a way that I wasn't. Second, as a 12-year-old, he organized all the kids in his village for a Quit India March during the Quit India March. And they marched around their village, screaming out, Quit India to the Brits. Of course, the local cops uh, didn't take him too seriously at mm. age 12, but... That was his spirit. Third, he dropped his caste surname when he was in college because of his support from Mahatma Gandhi's anti-casteism. Uh, and, and, and in every respect, he was somebody who had ideas and views and energy. And, and it was a kind of guy who, who really managed to spend time getting along with people. So I would, he would I have would, been better in politics than I have been. I, and I do want to go back to that walk that you took with him uh, um, uh, on Marine Drive, where he's looking back and regretting uh, his belief in corporate He said, punishment. I didn't know any better. He said, I didn't know any better because that's what his understanding of parenting was. That's right. But there was one exam you didn't top and was there hell to pay for that? There was one year that I didn't class top. Eight? Class eight. Yes. I think I came third or something in class. And when I came home, it was like there was a death in the family. I mean, my mother yeah. could barely bear to look at me. <laughs> I remember her turning away with a sort of dark cloud on her face. And uh, uh, my father was there. I remember lying in a darkened room wishing the sky would came down upon me or at least the ceiling. It's a very strange sort of thing. But that was partly, I think, uh, my mother's drive more than my father would probably have been more indulgent or understanding in the end. Mm. But my, 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 my mother was, uh, she was driven throughout her life by a sort of restless discontent. Uh, and that's something which is difficult to explain because she herself um, was not a high academic achiever, mm. but she expected her children to be. Um, and she threw herself around very widely, did a lot of things, but rarely had the staying uh, instinct to stick to her. But she, she, she had amazing talents uh, that she never quite fully worked on enough to bring to fruition. But I think she saw her children as her way to to, yeah. to achieve whatever she could. So, you know, they say that as we grow older, we become some versions of our parents. We never think we will, but we do. Um, as speaking as a father, did you find that you became some version of, of your father with your I twins? I never whacked my kids. That's that's for sure. Was that a but reaction to what you had gone through or was, was that ideological? It's It was everything. It was both. It was also the fact that it's just not my instinct. I'm not the kind of, even in school, I haven't whacked anybody or hit anybody, even if... You've never people, had a fisticuff in the sandwich? I, I had one or two fisticuffs, but they consisted entirely of, uh, of you know, grabbing people by the collar when they were grabbing mm. me by the collar. But there wasn't, I actually haven't, my fist or, or, or hand hasn't encountered somebody else's body parts, if mm. you want to, you know, in violence. So, so um, it just isn't my instinct. But also my kids were, I mean, I remember around age one, my twins had the habit of pulling my books off the bookshelf. 
So whenever I got angry and marched at them with a threatening hand, you know, like raising my hand as if I was about to whack them, they would giggle even more uncontrollably and knock more books off the table. They found it so funny that their father would threaten them. Then after a while, I started laughing too. Have they done something that you really disagree with? Actually, probably not. I mean, I, I have to give them full credit for being such such outstanding kids that uh, no, they haven't. But then that's also because I've been, uh, I've had very, very little desire to control their lives. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've been, I've had, you know, there's this old line of somebody who doesn't enjoy the respect he probably deserves more of. That's Khalil Gibran who said yeah. that uh, the ultimately prophet. the kids, yeah. your kids are not yours. Uh, they're sort of a, a trust that you, you, you've, been, you, mm -hmm. you've been placed in kind of thing or words to that effect. Mm -hmm. And, um, I must say that um, I've always felt their lives are theirs, their destiny is theirs, their fate is theirs. All you can do is guide, uh, forewarn where possible, advise when they seek it, uh, and pray, which I did a lot of for them. But touch wood, they seem to have done the right things by and large. And they've made their own choices. I don't think I would have wished for either of them to end up in journalism, and they both have. Yeah, intriguing. Um I don't know how many people know how young you were when you actually ended up at the United Nations. But before that, before you became an international diplomat, you had uh, dreams of joining the Indian Foreign Service. And in one of your very old interviews, I chanced upon the fact that the reason you didn't do it at the time is that you were extremely disturbed by the emergency. Yeah. Talk a little so bit about So what that. happened was that in 1975, uh, I'd got the scholarship to go. Um, college finished, I think, in June, if I remember right, or May, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was um, American University started in September. In those days, there weren't elaborate orientations and so on, certainly not for graduate school mm -hmm. anyway. So I was going towards the end of August. So I had the whole summer in India, uh, in Calcutta, where my parents were living at the time. Uh, and I was doing some theater, amateur theater. So I remember acting in Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap as the hero who turns out to be the villain to a great part. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so while You're I was... You're not supposed to give away the story. I know. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Do. Spoiler anyway, alert. Yeah. <laughs> but in fact, the play's been around for 70 years. Everyone knows this. Okay, Anyone who's interested in watching would have watched it by mm -hmm. now, I hope. But anyway, so while I was doing all of this was when the emergency was declared. Mm -hmm. And um, needless to say, I, I wasn't terribly thrilled about the circumstances. Uh, even though as president of St. Stephen's College Union the previous year, I had kept the union out of the JP movement. Why? I, because we it, were a non-political union. I, I mean, so frankly, one thing our college is criticized enormously for. I know. But, but, but the truth is that we discussed it within the union. Mm. And the conclusion we came to was individuals okay. were free to go and participate if they wanted. I myself went uh, to listen to uh, JP at the Gandhi Peace Foundation when he first talked about total revolution and so on. Uh, but I didn't go to any of his mass rallies because, I've, again, that would have been overtly political. But I know, for example, Chandan Mitra who was my chancellor of the Exchequer. Mm. Uh, he went uh, to one of the mass rallies and I not only didn't stop him, I, I encouraged mm. people to follow mm. their own interests. But I felt it was important that the, the, the college continue its tradition of being non-political. Uh, but I also don't forget, I had been in college as a fresher in 72 mm. when we had the notorious Delhi University strike that shut the college and the university down for three months. And I kind of felt those were three months of my young life wasted right. uh, in many significant ways. Mm. I didn't particularly want to get the college dragged into that kind of politics. Uh, so in any case, I, I, I didn't. But despite the fact that I hadn't, I had a lot of sympathy. And then you are in the United States of America. No, not yet. No, so not so yet. what happened was when I when the emergency declared I'm I'm in India, um, I was you know doing my freelance writing. Um, uh, I I was strongly influenced by the people I knew at the Statesman, which was actually a newspaper rather like the Indian Express, that was very critical of the emergency. The uh, managing director of the Statesman, Kushru Irani, uh, uh, I remember him coming home for a dinner or whatever. And, and 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 celebrating, for example, the end of Mujib mm. and saying that he hoped that the Indian prime minister would end the same way, which shook me to the core mm. because My it really God. was a horrifying yeah. thought. But it was the extent of the vehemence with which many people uh, reacted mm. to what they saw as a suspension of Indian democracy during the emergency. So so I, I, I saw all of this and I could see why. And I had a personal experience. I had written a, a, a short story, which you can read in my collection, The Five Dollar Smile, called The Political Murder. Mm. And it got banned. So I remember going to the junior statesman's office who, who, or the JS. Who, who banned it? They had censors sitting in all publications in the first couple of weeks of the emergency. 
and there was this big chop applied on the table. The, the editor showed me my my typescript, mm -hmm. big chop on it, thing you know, uh, banned for publication or whatever by the censor, mm -hmm. who was sitting in the office of JS Magazine. So that was uh, for me uh, kind of, but you know, I was at the same time sufficiently receptive to the arguments being made by Mrs. Gandhi's government at that time, that um, the country couldn't afford anarchy and disruption, you know, the, the sort of stuff. Because at that time, our democracy was still fairly fledgling. Uh, we were trying to find out what it meant in terms of actual lives. And here was somebody, the, the prime minister claiming should actually improve the lives of the poor. Remember, first week of the emergency, she abolished bonded labor, uh, things like that. Uh, talked about how politics was just completely disrupting. So are you prospects. saying you were conflicted? About so I was conflicted in the initial days. I actually, when I went to America, I also had the additional pressure of India being attacked by Americans around me out of a fair amount of ignorance. They had mm. no real knowledge of India. Um, and they were sort of cl cliched denunciations of India's poverty, of India's quote-unquote socialism, of India's pro-Sovietism, etc. And I felt there was also a lot of ignorance. So like every Indian who goes abroad for the first time, my instinct was to speak up mm. for my country. Mm. And that in this particular case meant defending or at least finding some virtue. I remember saying to people, look, as somebody whose writing was banned, or one article was banned, one story was banned, you know, I'm very conscious that the suspension of civil liberties mm. affects people like me. But if it actually improves the life of the poor person sleeping on the sidewalk, who am I to sit in judgment? But, ob but obviously this, this argument changes. No, and, that, and it changed. That's exactly what happened. I had a roommate, fortunately, at Fletcher, who was a journalist. Mm. And so he was able to bring me copious reams of, of telexes of Reuters and AFP and other dispatches coming in beyond what was printed in the American papers. Mm. And so I was getting a heck of a lot of information from India, much more than I would have seen by just subscribing to newspapers in America, and, and of course, than I could have read in the censored press in India. And that's when my eyes opened. So in a matter of months, I began to see the emergency was doing a lot of harm a lot of damage to India and indeed to the very people in whose name it was proclaimed the poor. The Turkman Gate demolitions, the uh, vasectomy, yeah. vasectomy drive in which people were caught up and punished, all the sorts of horror stories we heard about the emergency were actually available to read. Would uh, you would you have been uh, an IFS officer if it were not for the emergency, you think? I probably would have, yeah. I mean, in the sense that I was damn good at taking exams, so I'm immodest enough to say I'd have probably aced those exams too, but I never wrote them because... Um, uh, the first year I would have been illiterate. You needed in those days, if I remember right, to be 21. Mm. I'd gone to Fletcher at 19. So I, I, I had uh, two degrees under my belt uh, before I turned 21. But I could have. In fact, I planned to come back to mm. India in the summer of 77. I came back in the, those heady, uh, the heady months when Mrs. Gandhi had just uh, uh, lost the election and when, when there was this excitement in the air about uh, a new revival of Indian democracy. Uh, so I could have taken the exam, but by then... Um, I had also watched what happened mm. during the emergency in America. I remember there was a student leader, I think his name was something like Arvind Kumar, uh, who had spoken out against the emergency in Chicago. Then he applied for the renewal, of the routine renewal mm. of his passport. And the Indian embassy said, you surrender your passport, we're sending you back home. And I thought, my God, you know, uh, this is a right we've all taken for granted, the right to express our views. Mm. And, and here we have this being done to an Indian citizen. And then I'm sorry to say I saw the then Indian ambassador, I think out of decency one shouldn't mention his name, mm. who really had behaved uh, almost like a propagandist for dictatorial rule during the emergency. And the moment Mrs. Gandhi was defeated, the same ambassador rushing off to hail the victory of democracy and so on. I thought, my God, if highly qualified IAS, IFS, ICS kinds of people uh, are, are reduced to such pathetic mm. uh, imitations of, of, of human beings, by the system, then is this a system I want to serve? And so I decided not to take the exam. I missed the deadline, before, which was before the elections. I would have had to apply before the elections. Uh, so I didn't apply to take them. The elections then took place and gave us an unexpected result. Uh, and when the result came, um, it, it was partially, of course, too late to change my mind, but partially also um, there were changes in my life. I decided at the ripe old age of 21 to get married. And I decided to, to, to go ahead and try write a PhD and 
possibly explore other career options in life. Mm. And that's, I ended up doing both of those instead. Yeah. And then come uh, sort of the glory years of the United Nations. Were there simpler years than your life today? Simpler in some ways. Obviously, any sort of structured bureaucracy is more organized. Yeah. But challenging in their own ways and, and, and satisfying in a very different mm. way. Um, I, I worked uh, first eight years for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees of which the undoubted highlight was being head of the office in Singapore at the peak of the boat people crisis. Mm -hmm. When I literally arrived in a Singapore where we not only had an overflowing refugee camp, but people were actually living in trees because there was no mm -hmm. physical room to accommodate them. And where the, the UN still had a policy of being quote unquote non-operational. So there were no real staff to do all this. And I uh, had to really put on the, the most inventive uh, solutions that I could come up with for all sorts of problems, which brought out the best in me. Mm. Um, I, I found a very creative way of financing operations that I was not supposed to be having by uh, going to the Jesuits in, in Singapore and saying, I was a former Jesuit student myself, <laughs> so you can do me this favor. You know, I want you guys to sponsor mm. somebody who nominally on paper will be working for you, but as far as the Singapore government is concerned, be working for me and who in fact will be working for me. <laughs> and that solution gave me a camp administrator for the first time, which we needed desperately. I also found creative solutions to resettling a lot of intractable cases out of mm. the camp, which won me some favors with the Singaporeans because they were getting incredibly frustrated with the buildup yeah. of cases and were saying that they were prepared to even change their policy and prevent people mm. from being offloaded in Singapore mm. if we didn't succeed in getting them out, which I did. And then I started attracting refugees from other nations who had to be handled with utmost discretion. And I solved uh, the first Polish refugees when martial law was declared in Poland, uh, were Polish seamen who jumped off a ship there. I solved, a very, I mean, if we have the time, I can tell you a couple of stories that were quite amazing about this period. Um, and, and, um, and, and so I ended up, I think, growing enormously within myself, but also uh, within the UN as somebody who could solve some interestingly challenging problems. And of course, you run for the top job. And, you well, know. that was much later. So yeah. this is the first eight and a half years. Then I go to New York and work in peacekeeping. I end up, by sheer fluke, ending up being Mr. Yugoslavia when that becomes the biggest <laughs> operation the UN has yes. ever known. Yes. Uh, and I, I'm sitting on top of it. It's growing under me, as it were, a huge affair. Uh, that really was sort of the the making of me in terms of every major country mm. had to notice me because they had to deal with me yeah. uh, to follow the uh, what we were up to in peacekeeping in Yugoslavia. And then um, the man who had become my boss as Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping, Kofi Annan, uh, runs for Secretary General, an idea I'm proud to say I planted in him. And I unofficially and possibly against all the rules of the UN uh, was his discreet campaign manager. And uh, we won. And he became Secretary General and he insisted okay. on, without even asking, he assumed I would come with him to the Secretary General's office. So I spent three or four years there, not as his right hand, I would say, but as one of his right fingers. The Secretary <laughs> General has many right fingers. Um, but um, uh, that was a fascinating period mm -hmm. because I saw the world uh, from the top with the Secretary General. You know, so yeah. Tea with Tony Blair in Downing Street and... Uh, and 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 vodka with Yeltsin and the Kremlin and and, and the glamorous. and jasmine tea with the with with the Chinese president uh, mm. Zhao Yang in in um, in uh, this I've now forgotten the name of the 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 the, the place the Forbidden Palace where the the right. Chinese leadership gathers etc cetera, etc cetera. so amazing time and when Kofi Annan was invited to meet the Pope. Uh, for example, he could take one person with him, and he took me. So I had some amazing encounters, which I'm very pleased to uh, pleased to recall as as part of the extraordinary time. And then he sort of kicked me upstairs to be Under Secretary General myself, handling what was the largest department in the yeah. organization, the Public Information Department. Uh, we had offices in 88 countries. We were tremendously under the cosh. The Americans wanted budget savings and cuts in that department. And I was able to reform it and demonstrate my credentials as a manager. And then many ambassadors came to me mm. saying, why don't you run for Secretary General when Kofi's term is up? So I had a crack at that because, of course, yeah. the Indian government well, uh, had the same idea at the same yes. time and they backed me. At the end of the day, it didn't work out, as Groucho Marx would say, close but no cigar. <laughs> and, uh, and my UN career ended. But if I look back on those 22 years, I have yeah. to say, 29 years, I beg your pardon, I would have to say it was 22 months of the emergency we were yeah. talking about, 29 years of the UN. Um, I would have to say that it really was an extraordinary period of my life and, 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 and something which in many ways, uh, I think, is so completely different from the political world I've plunged into since. Yeah. That I, I can't really compare the two.
Now, in the political world, you have lived, as I guess, Anybody uh, who lives in the public gaze, who has a mind of their own, who has a degree of success and recognition, who has a way with words, sometimes a way with wrong words, we all put our foot in it sometimes, you have lived under the microscope, I think almost continuously, from the time you entered politics. And one of the more bizarre allegations, I think, in your initial campaign years was that you were accused of being an Israeli agent, and you had to pull out a photograph with Yasser Arafat to prove your credentials. Was that the most sort oh, that of, was was that one the most of, one absurd of many, sort but, of allegation? You know, that campaign, that was my very first campaign, yes. the 2009 election. Yes. And, you know, uh, people just didn't know how to do the, 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 the CPM, the, the commies were holding that yeah. seat, the two previous elections. Yeah. So I was a threat to a seat that was, a, was a, their seat, as it were. And I... Um, uh, had come in as a somewhat unknown quantity, but one who had enjoyed the backing of all parties, including the CPM, when I ran for Secretary General. In yeah. fact, Prakash Kara wrote an editorial in their, in their uh, People's Democracy magazine, yeah. um, condemning the Americans for vetoing me and so on. So yeah. they would have been at a bit of a loss as to how to oppose me. The first tactic they tried was to say, look at this guy, you know, he's suited, booted. How can he sort of represent us? Mm. Uh, he doesn't even pro speak proper Malayalam. How can he speak for us? Oh, no, all this kind of stuff. He, he'll have to sit in air-conditioned offices. He can't possibly be a political representative and so on. And I was able to dispel that line of campaigning by simply uh, wearing a munda, which I'd done on previous trips to Kerala on holidays, and speaking to people in fairly simple Malayalam. My Malayalam wasn't great, but it was mm. Malayalam picked up on annual holidays home in my childhood. Is it better now? And Oh, much, much, mm. much. But anyway, and I would, I would end up by saying, listen, as you can see, I speak enough Malayalam to understand your hopes and your needs and your problems. But more important, I speak the English and the Hindi you need to have these expressed in Delhi, which is where the job is. Speaking fine Malayalam won't get you very far with ministers and bureaucrats in Delhi. And that argument resonated mm. very well with the voters, mm. uh, which left the, the, the commies looking for another line of argument. Their other line of argument was that I was actually, they couldn't try me as an American capitalist stooge because they had been defending me against the Americans. So they decided I was an Israeli agent. And there were hilarious memes, you know, James Bond movie posters modified for me as a Mossad agent and so on, because they, they, they thought this would actually yeah. appeal with both the leftist voters yeah. and with... Uh, the very small but 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 active Muslim vote. Yeah. We have only about 10% uh, Muslim population in Trivandrum parliamentary mm. constituency, but they tend to turn out to vote. Uh, they're conscious of their civic rights. And so that was probably going to be a damn thing. So it had, it had some effect. I think it's estimated that the, uh, the voter turnout in the Muslim areas in 2009 was very much lower than normal. Mm. But I still won the election handily by a, million, by, by a lack of votes. Uh, in, in what was unusually a four corner contest, because in addition to uh, me, the communists who came second, the BJP who came third, there was also a BSP candidate who was a former Congress MP. Because mm. people forget that in 2009, there was serious talk that Mayabati might become prime minister. Of I do remember government. that. I'm old enough to remember that. That's right. So there you are. Uh, I won that election, but then uh, obviously that, that story got very quickly dispelled because people would see who I was. They listened to me. They read me. They saw me at work. And a subsequent, I'm pleased to say that the Muslim community has backed me solidly in both the two subsequent I mean, you, elections. You, 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 and minorities generally have seen that I've been a, a yeah. staunch and consistent voice for uh, what is called secularism, but I define much more as pluralism. We'll talk about that. But, uh, you know, uh, perhaps the most harrowing public scrutiny, public commentary uh, was after the death of your wife, Sunanda Pushkar. And it was not... It was not something I think you could ever have imagined that you and murder would be spoken of in the same sentence. You can imagine. It took many years before the story, the, the, the charge of murder shifted to abetment to suicide. It would be a long time before a Delhi court actually said, we drop all charges. I want to ask you today, with the benefit of some distance, to tell our audience, what, what could it possibly be like to actually have people whispering, did he murder his wife? Yeah, it's absolutely incredible, Barkham. And I, I was uh, initially in a state of shock, first of all, about uh, a, a young and vibrant personality disappearing like that. Mm. Uh, so, so there was already that shock to be absorbed. And then there were these incredible stories. It started apparently with a TV show within two days of her death on one of the Hindi channels, which somebody watched and, mm. and talked about. 
Um, and, and it just continued to snowball as certain very malicious individuals for their own reasons, which they will have to figure out, started embellishing these conspiracy theories with blatant lies. There were literally falsehoods invented. You know, that she had gone in a car to meet Ahmed Patel, mm. uh, that there were two hitmen from du Dubai who had checked into the same hotel. I mean, there were incredible lies being made up. Uh, one politician even claimed, oh, he poured Russian poison into her mouth as if he had been sitting there and witnessing at uh, the last moments, this kind of nonsense. Mm. And, you know, I was strengthened by only two things. First of all, my own conscience, because I knew that I had mm. done none of these things. But secondly, by the fact that Sunanda's family stood by me throughout. Both her brothers and her son knew the reality of my relationship with her from good and from bad. They knew my, my qualities as a human being. And no, none of them at any point expressed any doubts or any misgivings. Uh, they didn't play along with any of these uh, attempts by the media to persecute me. And, and, and uh, since I was cooperating fully with the police, I encouraged them to do the same, share any misgivings they might have had. They didn't have any, but they spoke to the police fully, as did I. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it became very clear after a while that whatever the motivations for this ongoing harassment were, they had much more to do with politics and much less to do with any uh, actual But But living through that it. time, your, your elderly mother was accosted by a neighbor yeah. with questions about what had happened and what was your role in it. Oh, it was worse. I mean, it was, it was, you know, she, she was, people spoke to her in the elevator of her building in Kochi, almost as if, you know, she was the mother of a murderer kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and for a mother who, as it is, had felt that my achievements uh, were good, but not enough to satisfy her, you can imagine how shattered she was by all of this. Um, and it was hard. It was really, And really you, hard. how did you function? Because there is a certain, um, I would say, operational efficiency to you. Maybe that comes from decades of training in the United Nations. But, you know, no global crisis could have prepared you for actually for being accused of murder. For intense, something as intensely personal as this, because it, yeah. it, it, it really was um, essential for me to take stock of myself. And it took a while to just say, listen, don't let them define who you are. You know who you are. Mm. You know, if you've really done something evil and were trying to hide it, you'd be a disaster at it because your conscience wouldn't let you. Mm. But since you've done nothing wrong, why should you let them determine how you will appear? And I remember a line that Kofi Annan had told me when he was unfairly attacked mm. during the so-called oil for food scandal in the United Nations. He said his father had taught him uh, a Ghanaian proverb. So when the sharks bite you, do not bleed. And I said, Kofi, you don't understand. I mean, surely when the sharks bite you, you will bleed. And he said, one day you will understand. So I had thought about it and fully quite got the message. Mm. But when this happened, it suddenly came to me in a blinding flash. You can't give the sharks the satisfaction of knowing you're bleeding because that's what they want. When they are biting you, they're doing it for their pleasure, for their satisfaction, mm. for their greed, for their TRPs or their political votes or whatever their agenda may be. Mm. If you suffer, you're actually enabling them. And that realization helped me to just completely act as if they didn't exist, to just go ahead, ignore them. It was also the advice of my lawyers not to react, not to respond, and not to sue. So I didn't. Uh, I just did my work, wrote my books, made my speeches, and began allowing others to see me Mm. in other contexts. So, for, for example, that speech that became my best-known speech ever at the Oxford Union was in the summer of 2015, just a year and a half after Sananda's death, when this was still the dominant trope yeah. about me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think it did help change a lot of people's perceptions uh, as to who I was when the Prime Minister himself said this was the right thing to say in the right place at the right time. Now, that kind of stuff would not be said about somebody whom they really believed was guilty of murder. Mm. Um, the sort of rather desperate search for evidence and the inability to find any was also becoming fairly evident. Um, and one or two journalists were beginning to realize this and, and were beginning to say so to me, mm. though none somehow found it expedient to run a story pointing out to all the holes in the conspiracy theory against me. Um, but anyway, I stuck it out. Um, 
we were told by various people that their friends and the police had told them that the police had essentially given up on the investigation because there wasn't a shred of evidence to support any charge mm -hmm. um, and that the file was sitting with the police commissioner for uh, closure. But uh, after a year and a half of being in limbo like that, suddenly out of the blue and predictably the year before the 2019 election, suddenly the police go and file uh, a charge sheet alleging abetment to suicide. So um, even though the, invest the active investigation, the interrogations, all that was completely over a year and a half earlier, and we had been told the whole thing would be, not by the police officially, but by people mm. who claimed to have excellent sources. And there were too many different people saying this for us not to believe it. We had genuinely thought it was just a question of them finding a propitious moment to close the file. Instead, they decided to throw it mm. before the courts. So then we had to go through the process of arguing. But fortunately, um, that process went well. I had an excellent lawyer in Vikas Pahava, his assistant Gaurav Gupta and others, and a courageous judge who um, didn't allow herself to be intimidated uh, into, into uh, but why, going But while all of this was happening, and of course, as you said, you know, your mother was being treated as the mother of a murderer by some neighbors in her building. Suddenly, your entire life, not just your life with Sunanda, but your personal life prior to that, your marriages prior to that, your divorces prior to that, you know, your relationships were up for drawing room gossip. You know, everybody was speculating, talking, whispering. And of course, in a city like Delhi, in a country like India, it all gets back to you. How did you deal with that? Because I think public figures are trained to deal with many things. But when your own life, you know, in particular, who you've loved, who you've been with is deconstructed. You know, how did you deal with that? With difficulty. I mean, part of it, frankly, Barkha, is uh, to follow the simple rule that I've tended to follow every time in life, even before all of this happened, which is to take people only at face value. In other words, you may hear that somebody who you think is a friend has been bitching about you behind your back. Mm -hmm. But since you haven't seen it firsthand, um, you owe it to yourself to behave with that person as their behavior to you would warrant. Yeah. Now, when they behave badly, then you step aside. But when they're behaving directly to your face in a friendly manner, uh, for you to be churlish uh, in return is not right. So the same logic, I knew that some of the people who were inviting me home or calling me to parties or, or praising me on stages were going around as soon as my back was turned and whispering behind me, I knew because people were saying that they were. Yeah. But as long as I didn't have first-hand evidence of it, I refused to behave accordingly. And that was wise because a lot of these people subsequently have come around and I've had to live and work with them. Uh, yeah. So I can't possibly uh, have just built up a large cupboard full of enemies. The second thing, as I said, was to lose myself in work. So knowing particularly in those first couple of years that a lot of the social engagements were just poison pools, um, I would make a token appearance to show I wasn't afraid and nothing to hide, but I would rarely linger long enough. Mm -hmm. I'd go back, uh, get back to my computer and do my work. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't sitting around partying and, and being a social animal, which Sunanda had been, and along with her, I had become very much, uh, yeah. you know, there was a danger of, of being typecast as a page three politician, which, which wasn't my style mm -hmm. naturally. And so I went back to being my natural self, which was to read and write a lot more. And I, as a result, some of my most productive years as a writer happened when I was under the cot for this uh, for these false charges. Has all of this scarred you for love? I don't know. I suppose it makes you a, a little bit more cynical. But there's something sort of you know about my uh, sort of what can I say my my hopeless naivety about human beings that uh, even my political allies sometimes despair of me. Um, that that it's almost too easy to to win me back, as it were, to to hopeless cause. So are you saying you're, politically... are you saying you're still a romantic in your sixties? Well, I'm fortunately probably getting too old for romance <laughs> in any meaningful sense of the term, but I'm certainly capable of it. Well, that is, uh, I think, that would interest a number of people in our audience. Um, in the end, we have a few minutes left. I want to talk about what kind of liberalism you identify with. You mentioned earlier that you would no longer use the word secular. It's become a corroded sort of word. It doesn't mean that you have any, let me preface this by saying it doesn't mean you don't believe in pluralism. I do, very passionately. Yes, so I'm just underlining that. But I think in different ways, all of us uh, who come from a certain socioeconomic privilege, um, who have been insulated, who have been somewhat in some ivory towers, even those of us who are from middle-class backgrounds, we've had to learn as we get exposed to 
real life and a world outside, that maybe the language we have to express our liberal progressive thoughts in is not a language that a lot of people understand. We have to learn a new language. For instance, you wrote a book on why you identify as a Hindu. You know, a few decades ago, you may not have identified as that. I have, you know, staunchly left religion and caste columns empty, but I recognize, at least in the caste context, it's my privilege that allows me to leave that column empty. Right? True. And I, I haven't left those columns empty for one simple reason, that I actually have been saying this before. In fact, as I pointed out when I wrote Why I'm a Hindu in 2018, I had actually said in three pages of India from midnight to the millennium, what I said over 300 pages in Why I'm a Hindu um, 20 years later, because... In, in the era when I wrote India from Midnight to the Millennium, it didn't seem to me mm. necessary to belabor the point. I just wrote it in order to explain the context from which I was attacking the people who demolished the Babri Masjid and who were, uh, who were you know, reading, leading the Ramdan Muhumi cause and so on as to what was wrong with them. I was speaking as a believing Hindu and I wasn't attacking them purely as a sort of godless secularist as many people would have assumed that I might have been. Um, so yes, I, I, I've been consistent in my espousal of Hindu faith, something I grew up with, but I have an understanding of Hindu faith, which is my parents' understanding as well, that it's one that absolutely believes in acceptance of other people's uh, uh, different ways of living and being, and that doesn't judge them. In fact, in my life, I have never tended to be someone who judges people. I accept people as they are, and I accept their right to be who they are, to live as they want, as long as they don't harm others in the process. So somebody is gay, that's their issue. Somebody is, uh, you know, RSS, that that's their issue. Somebody is, uh, you know, a, a bearded Muslim, that's their issue. Somebody is an agnostic, that's their issue. As far as I'm concerned, they're all human beings. Judge them for who they are, judge them, if you, I mean, if you relate to them rather, not judge them. Relate to them for who they are and how they relate to you. As long as they don't harm you and they don't harm others, let them be who they are. Let them be and become yeah. who they want to be. That's been my philosophy of daily life. Has politics and translated changed? into politics. Yeah, has politics changed? You know, on the contrary, politics is a daily reminder of our diversity. There's so many different kinds of people. If I didn't accept them all for who they are, I would not be able to survive in politics. And that's why I find political intolerance that much more difficult to swallow because the very people who are behaving like this are living in a society where they're meeting lots of people who don't conform do, to their stereotypes. Do you have in your lived life thus far any serious regrets? Oh, of course. No, I, I don't mean, oh, you know, I wish I had taken that exam. I wish I had met so-and-so. Something deep that haunts you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I think frankly, if, if, it had, if I hadn't been living in America, would I have actually initiated my, my divorce with my... Uh, wife, my college sweetheart, somebody we've been together with for 22 years. Uh, this is your first divorce? My, my first divorce, yeah. I mean, that that in many ways um, has been uh, a cause of much painful introspection for many years. And and the truth is that um, that I think in America it was easier in that slightly more atomized society mm -hmm. to think that, you know, I won't live a lie. I, I'm going to be myself mm -hmm. and do what is right for me and so on. Uh, whereas in India, with the buffer of family, society, cultural practices, many people who are having difficulties in their marriage tend to say, you know, we'll, 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 we'll work it through and there's lots of support systems to keep, keep us going. Um, and that's true even a generation later. I mean, my divorce is 1999, so we are talking about a generation later. There's still relatively few divorces in India because society mm. works, if you like, conspires to keep families together. Um, so that's something that I've regretted. I, I don't, I've never believed that uh, the people who say they go through life without regrets are genuinely being honest. Because I think that the unexamined life is one that's not worth yeah. living. You, if you've lived a life that's, yeah. that's full of incident and of thought and of action, you honestly have had occasion to look back on it at various times, small and big, including the small things you mentioned. Wish I'd done this, wish I'd yeah. done that, wish I'd not said this, wish I'd yeah. said that. Um, but those kinds of regrets, everyone should have. Um, but also, uh, I think the big things in life. I've, I've also learned to live with failures. I mean, you know, what has been I your biggest? This, this, what is what, what do you what do you identify as your biggest failure? Well, the biggest failures have clearly been number one, the the loss of the Secretary General's uh, race. Because when I ran there, 
Um, I must say that I almost allowed myself to believe that my entire professional life had been a preparation for that. Mm. I was literally the only candidate ever mm. who had done every one of the key roles mm. and therefore was familiar yeah. with everything that a yeah. Secretary General needed to do. I'd done humanitarian, I'd done political, I'd mm. done security council, I'd done peacekeeping, I'd done public information, I'd done management. I mean, there wouldn't have been a better prepared Secretary General. So suddenly I gave myself the illusion, boy, I'm the right person for mm. this job. It took me a while to realize that actually this is not a job that comes according to your resume. Yes. <laughs> it comes on the basis of Welcome political Welcome to the decisions. real world, yeah. And, and the Americans had made their minds up, no more Kofis, by which they meant nobody who was capable of articulating a point of view that could take them above the heads of governments to appeal to the world public, as Kofi had successfully done. Uh, they wanted somebody who would listen to them and, 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 and be, a, be a good conforming uh, servant of governments. And, and I must say, it was a very healthy lesson in realizing yeah. uh, the old cliche that life isn't always fair, nor are political well, elections. Well, think of it like this. If, if, if you had won that election, you may not have been here as a three-time member of parliament uh, for Thiruvananthapuram. So, you know, they say destiny, God, fate, uh, what have you, That's has right. a plan. Before we say goodbye and thank you to you, tell us about a new word that you've learned that would best describe your current state of mind. Oh, it's not necessarily a new word. I think some uh, a, a very, very old word. Uncertain, I think, in many ways about many things. Um, what I've are done, you uncertain I've about? That's tantalizingly interesting. What are you uncertain about? Oh, I'm uncertain about my own future, for one thing. Political done, future? Everything. Yeah, I mean, I've done three. Spell terms. that out. Do Spell I, that do out. Do I want to? Do I want to uh, uh, contest again for a fourth term? Um, do I believe that I have so what the Americans call the fire in the belly? to do justice to a fourth term. If I do, um, do I believe that the current role that I've had over the course of my third term is worth repeating in the fourth? These are all questions I have to ask myself. Could you be I looking am. for a major political... This conversation is not meant to be about news. It's not a news interview. So but, the journal, but the journalist in me, that itch has been scratched and I have to ask you. There is some sense that after you ran for the post of Congress president, um, you lost that post, you, your national profile definitely increased, but you haven't necessarily been treated the best by your party. There's a lot of speculation that you may leave the Congress. Could that happen? Look, I'm not contemplating that at the moment because I genuinely believe that uh, uh, the one party with which I'm most in sync in terms of convictions, values, style and so on is the Congress. In many ways, I, I uh, find myself instinctively articulating things which happen to be precisely the same things that the Congress spokesman does sometimes a couple of hours later. It's not as if I've taken a party line and followed it. We just think mm. along those lines and many of the key issues facing the country. So it's not that. I mean, I don't really have anything particularly uh, uncongressy, as it were, about my values and possibly within the Congress party. But are you hurt? I'm more to the right of center on yeah. economics. That is, along with the Montaques and Chidambarams mm. and Manmohan Singhs, rather than with the, the more left of center economics that... Uh, that many of my colleagues practice, but the Congress has been a big enough tent to accommodate mm. both sets of views. Um, and I think we need people who are pro-business in the party, just as we need people who are pro, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, more state control. As long as both sets of people believe in social justice, we end up in the same place, and we do. So all of this, uh, uh, you know, I have much more in common, as it were, with the Congress school of thought than with any other school of thought. And that's something that will keep me. But, you know, the real question to ask is that do I have to remain in politics? I mean, that's the That was question. going to be my next question. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that uh, at some point, and certainly I hope before I'm, you know, carried off to my eternal rest, that I will actually enjoy and deserve a life in which I can give my full attention to the writing that's always meant so much to me. Are you actually considering leaving politics? I'm not considering anything right now. I've got a full year of my term left, Barca. Don't make news in this yeah, kind no. of conversation. But uh, I think the time uh, may come when I have to sort of make some decisions. Sure. And it may well be just to continue what I'm doing. So, so that's not. But I'm just saying that um, there's a lot more to life um, than uh, what I'm doing right now. So let's end with that word of the day, uh, uncertain. It also leaves the door open for new things to happen, for different things to happen. And that always keeps things interesting. It's been a pleasure talking to you, uh, Shashi, on this podcast, Inside Out, where we hope to get to the person behind the persona. I hope our audience has learned something new and different about you than the usual political questions. I apologize for the last two because I couldn't resist my sort of second skin, which is to be a news report. But mostly, I think we step back from that. So thank you, Shashi. Pleasure. Thanks so much, Barka. Great pleasure.